Hi there. This is going to cover your human tissues, only the epithelial tissue section for your chapter five in your anatomy and physiology, McGraw-Hill. You have all the information right there. If you're not in my class and you want to check this out, there you go. All right. So the first thing is the introduction of the epithelial tissue. In looking at this, these are your expected learning outcomes. Uh, you should be able to understand and describe those properties that are going to distinguish epithelial tissues from other tissue classes. You should be able to list and classify eight different types of epithelial distinguish from each other and where in the body are they going to be found. All of that is extremely important. Uh, the structural differences between those epithelial tissues um, and then how those structural differences relate to their functional differences. Um, and you should also be able to visually just recognize each of those epithelial types from looking at specimens or photographs. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, your epithelial tissue, what is it? What is it? It's going to, the tissue itself is going to be a sheet of closely adhering cells. So the cells are very close together. Um, of one or more cells thick. So one means one layer of cells, more means two or more layers of cells uh, with the upper surface being exposed to an environment or internal space, like for example, a lumen. A lumen. Um, so it's going to cover body surfaces. Epithelial tissues can also line body cavities, okay? Most of the glands are going to be, um, uh, they're going to contain those epithelial tissues. Also, avascular. What does avascular mean? A means not. So a me uh, avascular means that they do not have blood vessels. So which means they the cells that make up the epithelial tissues are going to have to be nourished by other underlying connecting tissues those that actually do have blood flow to it. All right, so what is the function? What is the, what is the purpose um, of those epithelial tissues? Many different functions depending on what specific tissue you're looking at. And some tissues have more than one of these functions. So uh, protection, secretion, excretion, absorption, filtration, and sensation. So protection. Your protection, the epithelial tissues are going to protect, protect the deeper underlining tissues from infection and injury. Uh, secretion, that means those tissues are going to produce and release mucus. They could release sweat, enzymes, hormones, or either other substances and uh, chemicals and molecules. Excretion, excretion is basically going to be voiding waste from those tissues. So to kind of help you out, secretion, we'll go into this more detail, usually secretes into a duct or into a gland, into some other type of tissue. Excretion is eventually going to uh, leave the body, voiding waste. All right, absorption. Uh, your absorption of, of chemicals such as nutrients, and, and that's kind of weird to say that a lot of times well chemicals that must be bad no life is made up of chemicals if you recall uh so absorption is going to take place in these epithelial tissues filtration so all of the substances that are going to leave the body are going to be selectively filtered by epithelial tissues because you don't want just anything getting out of the body the body needs to be selective on what it allows to leave and what it's gonna keep. Last but not least, sensation. Sensation, your epithelial tissues are gonna contain nerve endings um, in that epithelial, and it's gonna detect stimulus. That stimulus could be tactile stimulus. That stimulus could be chemical stimulus. Uh, we'll get more into that as we go a little bit further. So in general, you need to know the general structure of epithelia. Um, like I told you before, the cells are going to be closely um, touching each other. A small amount of extracellular material is going to be present. Extracellular means outside of the cell. Intracellular is inside of the cell. Avascular 
means no blood vessels nourished by that underlying tissue. This is a little sum up of what we've already said, plus a little bit more. You also have with epithelial tissues, you have a high rate of mitotic division in the cells that are near connective tissue. The reason for this is because they are gonna be constantly replenishing themselves because they're in certain areas, there's gonna be a higher rate of slough, uh, sloughing off or damage or whatever that looks like, but that's also included into that protection. So we'll talk more about that when we get to that piece. And so you're gonna find, this is really important here, I mean, all of this is important, but we haven't talked about this yet. Your epithelial tissue is going to rest on a basement membrane, okay? That basement membrane, if you think about it, the basement, okay, the very bottom layer, and that's going to be a layer between an epithelium and underlying tissue. Um, that basement membrane is basically going to, might contain collagen, glycoproteins. If you recall, glyco meaning sugar, protein. So it's a sugar protein combination or other proteins or uh, carbohydrate complexes. Uh, it's gonna anchor the bank basement membrane anchors the epithelial tissue to the underlying connective tissue. So it's, it's essentially the barrier between the two. So, with that, you have the basal surface, the apical surface, and the lateral surface. So these are the surfaces of the epithelial cells themselves. If you recall, your levels of biological organization, the cells are the most basic unit of structure and function while still retaining life. Then if you get together many different cells that provide a similar structure function purpose that is going to be the next level which is taking you into tissue so feel free to review the levels of biological organization from previous chapters or your bio 1111 um, so your basal surface is going to be the surface that is closest to the basement membrane okay the apical surface is going to be the surface that faces away from the basement membrane and the lateral surface is going to be the surface between the basal and the apical surface, basically the surface on the side walls, okay? And this is kind of, you know, it doesn't really, this right here is kind of misleading. It's, it's the side walls, the surface of the side walls. Okay, so then the epithelial is gonna be classified. Let's go ahead and start first by the number of cell layers. If it's just one cell layer, we're gonna go ahead and call it simple. If it's two or more cell layers, we're gonna call it stratified, okay? So the simple epithelial, every cell is anchored to that basement membrane. In stratified, you only have the very bottom layer of cells that is anchored to the basement membrane and other cell layers are going to layer on top of the bottom layer of cells. So just kind of showing you here, saying simple, every single cell layer. And you can see right here is the basement membrane, okay? Now, this is really interesting. When you look here, this is pseudostratified. If you see here, pseudo meaning false, because, because the nucleus is all at different layers. You might look at this and be like, oh, that's several layers of cells. But the reason why it's pseudo, if you see every single cell has anchor to that basement membrane, even this one right here has anchor to that basement membrane. And so it is pseudo stratified, but it is not fully stratified. So let's show the difference. This is stratified right here, where you have one layer of cells that is anchored to the basement membrane and other layers of cells are going to stack on top of that. So this is a true stratification. All right, so let's go into the this, this shell, excuse me, the cell shapes, squamous. Look, it looks like it's squashed, right? This is a side view, this is a front view. So it's very flat looking. Cuboidal, cuboidal is, is just really easy. It looks like a cube. And in its 3D fashion, you can see that it is looking like a three-dimensional box or cube. Columnar, 
uh, columnar cell shape is going to have one side set longer than the other side set. So essentially it looks like a column. This is what it looks like in the 3D fashion. So I kept the figures on here. If you wanted to refer to your book to see that and get more information about that, you can go ahead and refer to those figures in your book. So now let's go ahead, I'm gonna back it up. Let's put the classes of epithelium together with the cell shapes of it. We're gonna start intermixing and getting several different combinations. So your simple epithelium, it's gonna have single layers, like I told you. So you can have simple squamous. Remember the squamous is gonna be the thin flat. Think about squashed, uh, something that looks squished. Say, okay, so your simple squamous, thin, scaly cells, and then you have your simple cuboidal, one layer of those cubed cells, uh, squarish. Sometimes your cuboidals look round also, but the big take home in it is the sides, the top, when you think about the length, the height, and the width, they're all very similar in size versus the height on a columnar is going to be larger in comparison to the width of that. So, all righty, so let's back this up again. You also have your simple columnar. Um, that is going to be one layer of those columnar cells. I already told you about the pseudostratified, but what made the difference on that, that false appearance. Um, so your goblet cells. Goblet cells are an additional type of cell. They look like a wine glass, hence that's why they get the goblet cell. These are going to be mucus secreting cells. So whenever you see a goblet cell um, in a simple columnar and the pseudostratified epithelial, you can know that these are going to be secreting mucus. All right, so let's go ahead and get started looking at some pictures here. Um, you got your simple squamous. So we have the, um, the microscopic look of it and a nice little drawn picture of it too. And over here in the side, you can see it's telling you where uh, you can go ahead and find that. So in figure 5.4. So single row, row of those thin cells. So what you're seeing here, cell, 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 cell. A single row of cells that is basically lining the alveoli. And so you can see it here where it's written out. And the alveoli are those sacs that are being produced by those simple squamous epithelial cells. And remember, individually, they're epithelial cells, but all together, collectively, they are epithelial tissue, okay? So your blood vessels, your blood vessels are gonna come from other underlying tissues. Because if you recall in previous slides, I told you the epithelial tissue is virtually avascular. And so, but your tissue does need to get nutrients and be able to get waste out. So that comes from other underlying tissue types. Okay, so um, purpose of this, rapid diffusion, transport of substances. Now, if you recall from your 1111, uh, the whole thing about the rapid diffusion, because these cells, I'm gonna go ahead and back this off here, because these cells have a greater surface area, right? in comparison to the volume of cytoplasm inside, that is going to, that increase of the surface area essentially is going to allow that rapid diffusion of nutrients to come in and waste to come out. It is perfectly designed this way. And so also your simple squamous epithelium are gonna secrete serous fluid. Um, we'll talk more about that too. <laughs> Uh, it's more of a, a watery type of fluid in comparison to a muca mucosa fluid, mucus fluid. Um, locations that you can find, simple squamous, alveoli, glomeruli, which is going to be um, in your, um, sorry, I'm having a brain fart because of my dog's barking in the background, uh, in your kidneys. 
uh, and then endothelium. Endothelium is going to line the um, it's going to line your organs on the inside, and then you have your cirrhosis. So we're going to go in that a little bit more detailed later. So your simple cuboidal epithelium, as you can see, they look like little cubes. Boom, 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 boom. Little little dice or cubes. Um, looking at a nice kidney here. Uh, if you look at your simple cuboidal here, one layer, just like I was telling you, that's the simple part. Cuboidal is the shape of the cells. So this, what we're looking at here is the lumen of the kidney tubule. And here are the cuboidal epithelium cells, epithelial cells, all together make tissue. So let's look on the inner portion of it. That is the basement membrane. That basement membrane is going to anchor every single one of those cells because it's a simple layer. The purpose of your simple cuboidal epithelial absorption and nutrition, uh, excuse me, absorption and secretion of, um, of nutrients and waste. Also mucus production. This is where you're going to find also goblet cells that are going to be in bed in here, which are not showing in this moment. Um, and movement. So your locations, you're going to find your simple cuboidal epithelial, the liver, thyroid, mammary glands, salivary glands, bronchioles, and kidney tubules. We are going to go into very specific details on all of this um, towards the end of our chapter. So it's going to actually be in a different video. So the next are the simple columnar epithelial. So simple columnar epithelial, uh, single row, row, narrow cells, which means they're longer than they are wide, like I told you. They're going to have oval-shaped nuclei um, in the basal half of the cell. So the basal is going to be by the basement membrane. And so you're going to find the nuclei being lower toward that basal part of the cell. Here's a perfect example. Check out this goblet cell right here. So the goblet cell is going to be, as you can see, intermixed and found in between those simple columnar epithelial cells. And you can see where it's going to go ahead and mucus produce in the goblet cell and secrete out. Okay. So... This is also showing you an example of a simple columnar epithelial that has microvilli. Not all of them do, but this is a beautiful, wonderful example uh, where it absolutely does. So from 1111, if you recall, the extensions of the uh, cell membrane, if you see what I'm doing with my, my little pointer here, those are going to be additional extent extensions of the cell membrane that increases the surface area of the cell membrane. And by increasing the surface area of that cell membrane, that's going to increase the ability to absorb nutrients and to release waste when applicable, depending on the cell and that organ or that tissue specifically. So sometimes we call it ciliated. Uh, I'm sorry, sometimes the sometimes they may be ciliated. Don't confuse ciliated with microvilli. Microvilli are the um, extensions of the cell membrane. Uh, ciliated are actually the presence of cilia, which are going to be a type of um, endoskeleton. So, all righty, like I said, may also possess goblet cells. So if what I just said is a handful for you, I strongly suggest you go back to your cell structure function chapter and review all of the different um, components of the cell and what their structure and their function is. So absorption and secretion. And so the function of your simple columnar epithelial is to absorb and secrete, and they can also secrete mucus. We've already talked about that. Where would I find this located? in the GI tract, in the uterus, kidneys, and also in uterine tubes. What you're looking at here 
is in the lining of the GI tract. Specifically, this is the uh, small intestine. How do I know? Because this is stomach. And also I know because the small intestinal cells of the simple columnar epithelial cells, they have those microvilli because that is where absorption of nutrients that you eat, your food that you eat takes place. Okay, so ciliated, which is not the microvilli, ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Oh my gosh, that is a mouthful. Let's say it again. Ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Ooh, okay, so where would I find this? So this is the actual um, microscopic view of it. Here's a nice picture of it. As you can see, the cilia are extending off of the surface. The basement membrane is on the basal surface down here. Um, you can see that you have the basal cells, boom, boom. And then this may look like it's not connected, but because this is a cut, you really can't see it could be connected slightly behind it because this is pseudo stratified. All of the cells are going to have some type of connection to the basement membrane. Okay. So it looks like it's multi-layered, but it's not. It's going to have nuclei at several different layers versus in the simple columnar the nuclei are going to be on the basal half of the cell. So seeing those differences, as you can see, that is a great identifier. Okay, has cilia, has goblet cells. We've already looked at that. Um, the purpose, the function, excuse me, is to secrete and helps to propel nucle uh, mucus. So that's what the cilia does. So the cilia, what you're looking at here is actually cross-section of the trachea. So these cilia serve to help to um, propel mucus out of the lungs, up the trachea, right? And then you end up swallowing that mucus. So a little tidbit for you, smokers. What happens with smoking, especially for very, very long-term smoking? the cilia get damaged and even damaged to the point that they're no longer present. So if you have functioning cilia, you naturally, your cilia are just going to remove mucus out of your airway and you're just going to swallow it. Sometimes you feel it, sometimes you don't. Depends on how bad your cold is or maybe not. But if you're a smoker and you've been smoking for a very long time, those cilia get damaged, paralyzed, or even not even present anymore, uh, non-functional. So that is why if you've ever been around a smoker with a smoker's hack or a smoker's cough, they're having to get the mucus out of their airway themselves because the mucus is natural. It's going to happen. It, it's, it's just a natural function. But because they don't have functioning cilia, to get the mucus out, what happens is they have to uh, uh, and they have to get it out themselves. I'll try not to subject you to that too much longer. Um, so guess what? That can be repaired. If you quit smoking, this is something that can begin function again. The degree of how well that really depends and how long it takes you to recover, it really depends on how long you've been smoking and how old you are and how far you are through your journey. All right, so locations, respiratory tract and portions of the malurethra. As you can see here, portions of the malurethra, the cilia need to uh, move that move that sperm on along to help it out and clean it out. Not clean it out, help it on its way. Okay, so let's talk about the stratified epithelia. So the stratified epithelia can range between two or more layers. So really two to 20 or more layers, which can be a lot. So some of the cells are gonna rest directly on each other. Um, only the deepest layer is going to attach to the basement membrane, only the bottom layer. The three stratified epithelial are gonna be named for their shapes. So how many layers is a stratified and their shapes, we talked about that. So you got stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, 
stratified columnar. And then the fourth type is going to be urothelium. And this is very unique to the urinary tract. They used to call it transitional epithelium. I'll mention this again, and you'll see why they used to call it transitional epithelium. So first, your stratified epithelium, the stratified columnar, excuse me, it's rare. It's only in places where two other epithelial types are going to meet. <clears throat> excuse me. So your stratified squamous is going to be the most widespread. So if I were to ask you, what's the most common stratified epithelium? Well, it's going to be the squamous. That would be the answer. So with that, your deepest cells are going to be cuboidal to columnar. They are going to include mitotically active stem cells. Okay. That's when the daughter cells at the bottom are going to be the ones that are mitotically dividing. And they're going to push the cells from that basement membrane up. And then that's how the layers build. The layers build from the basement membrane and push the next set of layers up. And as they push towards the surface, the cells become flatter as they migrate on up. They will eventually finally die and flake off. Hmm, exfoliation. Sounds a little bit like skin, doesn't it? Okay, so two kinds of stratified squamous epithelial are going to be keratinized and non-keratinized. So your keratinized are gonna be found on the surface skin they're going to be resistant to abrasion. The non keratinized are going to be found internally, lining the internal spaces, and they lacked, they, excuse me, they lack the surface layer of dead skin. So there's not that, that sloughing off that takes place like it would on your actual skin. Our next epithelium is going to be keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So keratinized means going to have that last waterproofing layer, right? Stratified means there are many, many layers. Squamous, squamous means that is has that squashed, thin, uh, very typical type of cell. And so let's go ahead and look here. If you look at the bottom of the foot, this is very indicative of the bottom of the feet, the, the soles of the feet, the palms of the hand, fingertips, toes. And if you are a monkey with a prehensile tail, you would have this on there too. So let's go ahead and look. This is going to be the outside surface. The outside surface is going to have those keratinized uh, dead squamous cells. And then the next layer underneath is also dead squamous cells. And these, when I say layer, this is layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of epithelial cells. And then this section here, that's going to be your living epithelial cells. And if you can see how this delineation of the line is, that right there is going to be the basement membrane in which all mitotic division, the cells that are just adjacent to that and that basal layer, that is where mitotic division takes place. And then it will push the cells and push the cells and push the cells causing these dead cells to then slough off. And then it just repeats that cycle. As you can see here on the other side, adjacent uh, to the basement layer, uh, basement membrane, you have dense irregular connective tissue. We're gonna go ahead and cover that a little bit later. And this is um, areol areolar tissue in this section here, but we're gonna go into the connective tissues in the next video. So anyway, this is just to show you what that looks like with the stratification. Uh, what would be the purpose, the big purpose, resisting abrasions? That's huge because the feet are going to need to re resist abrasions because they are so much, uh, so much when you're walking and everything. It's protective. How else does it protect? It is going to slow water loss through the skin. Okay. Also resist penetration by pathogenic organisms. And so, like I said, where they're located, they're located in the epidermis, specifically the palms, the sole of the feet are very heavily keratinized. 
Now, your non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial, um, your locations, you're going to find those, the tongue, oral mucosa, esophagus, vagina. The thing about this is it's not like the hands and the feet. They're not getting the same amount of mechanical abrasion and stimulation, but they are open to the outside via some type of opening. And because of that, they still do need protection. So it is also going to resist abrasion and uh, penetration of pathogens because pathogens have that way into your system. So with that, all of these uh, different types of organs are going to have an opening to the outside and uh, it's going to have some type of abrasive uh, motions that it needs protection from. So as you can see here, here is where the living epithelial cells are. And so they're all living epithelial cells. Um, they don't have that surface layer of dead cells. You can take your tongue and rub it on the inside of your mouth. If you've ever bit your cheek, you have probably put a big gaping hole in here. Well, if you know your gaping hole after a few days is much better, provided you don't keep biting your tongue, biting your cheek, right? Because these are living cells that are constantly replenishing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing up. And they do slough off. So if you took 1111, uh, you got a chance to see those cheek cells in your cell chapter. And then you can see here the basement membrane. That is where um, the first layer is going to be connected. And then this is going to be the underlying adjacent connective tissue. So this is the um, <clears throat> basically the picture drawing. This is the real uh, microscopic view. So let's move on. The next is stratified cuboidal epithelium. And as you can see here, it's got one, two, it's got more than one layer of those epithelial cells. And what we're looking at here, as you can see here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I like to look at this one because they draw it out nice. But these are the epithelial cells and they are cuboidal, but you can see they open up into a lumen a lumen where they're going to secrete something. And so very specifically, um, they could secrete sweat, uh, produce sperm, produce ov ovarian hor hormones. Uh, where are you gonna find these? You're gonna find them in those sweat glands, ovarian follicles, and in the seminiferous tubules. So, and right here you can see connective tissue intermixed between the basement membrane is surrounding and the first layer of cells, the cuboidal cells, are connected to that basement membrane. And then the next layer of cells, that is going to be the one that is more apical or apical. And that is what is going to secrete into whatever ducts that are applicable. Urothelium. So urothelium, that's the one that used to be called transitional epithelium. So you are going to find them, they're basically, they're multi-layered epithelium. Um, they change. That's why they used to call it transitional, but you are going to find them in the urinary tract, uh, very specifically located in the ureter and the bladder. Uh, if you're having trouble spelling stuff, every once in a while, maybe a lot more than that, you might hear me say things a little odd, right? If I were to say ureter, right, I could probably spell it, but I don't want you going to a job and being like ureter when really it's ureter. So, but however you need to do to spell it, because spelling does count, okay? So whatever that looks like for you. So I want you to think about when your bladder is empty. When your bladder is empty, you are not getting that pressure on your bladder. Now, this one right here, I guess it's really not a good example because it's really showing uh, within your kidneys. But I want you to think about when your bladder, when your bladder is empty, uh, the space, I could still use this example, the space inside your bladder is actually smaller, okay? 
And when that happens, all of the cells look cuboidal, okay? They look cuboidal. But then as your bladder starts filling up with urine, uh, that goes the same thing with your the rest of your urinary tract. Um, those cuboidal cells, if you can imagine the space inside your bladder, I'm using this as an example. We're not exactly looking at the bladder here, but it's the same premise. That space begins to fill and fill and fill and push is these cells flat. Pretty soon your bladder begins to distend and all of these cells look like they're flat. Okay, so these are nice and cuboidal looking when your bladder is empty. And when your bladder fills up, all of those cuboidal start to flatten out. That's why we used to call it transitional. But we're going to go ahead and call it uh, urothelium, especially for your practical. Okay, so beautiful. Um, I will be following up with the next is going to be, I'll just pull it out. The next is going to be your connective tissues. So go ahead and watch for that one.